Archaeology Southwest does what we call preservation archaeology, which focuses on the entire American Southwest. And one of the things that we try to do is to cover areas that uh, people tend to maybe know a little bit less about than uh, what we know about our local area. And so tonight's talk is going to take us down into uh, Western Mexico, and it's a, a matter of looking at uh, the Southwest without Pakime. So Michael Mathowitz is going to jump right into this, and I'll, I will uh, basically just turn it over to Michael. And, and thank you for coming over and uh, joining us here on a night when baseball is going on everywhere else. <laughs> And we won't say baseball one more time until the very end. OK, well, thank you very much for the uh, very nice introduction and for everybody coming to uh, the, the discussion tonight. Um, and I'll clarify what I mean by the Southwest without Pocky Bay. We might equally say the Southwest without Mesoamerica. Uh, OK, so what I'm going to discuss is uh, is sort of the culmination thus far of about 10 plus years of my own research. Um, I started as an undergraduate student. I graduated in 2001, and I was very interested in both the Southwest and Mesoamerican cultures in the past. And my undergraduate advisor, because I didn't know which region I wanted to focus upon, suggested that I look at the Casas Grandes culture. And so I did a little bit of field work when I began as a, with my bachelor's degree. Uh, I began uh, with Beth Bagwell and her dissertation research in the Chihuahua Sonora borderlands region with uh, Tim Maxwell at, the, uh, at a site just south of Casas Grandes, which is in Chihuahua, Mexico. And so I'm coming at, uh, I'm looking at the Casas Grandes culture and thinking about cultural change in the Southwest and trying to look at uh, the broader picture of cultural change across uh, a, a very large scale. So rather than looking at individual cultures and, and just, just local regions, what is happening in the broader uh, picture of the Southwest and Mesoamerica? And I'm very glad to uh, follow in the footsteps of a number of scholars who have talked about uh, this subject in, in the Archaeology Cafe series, Steve Lexon, Patricia Crown, um, Pat Gilman, Kelly Hayes Gilpin, uh, Paul Menes has talked about Pocky May, Randall McGuire, and others. And so I'm, I'm glad to be part of the discussion. And so what I want to talk about then is this idea of interconnected social change. All right? So we need to think about the broader picture. And so when we talk about Southwestern cultures, um, the, 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 the four main regions that, that uh, are, are particularly relevant to this discussion is Chaco Canyon in northern New Mexico, uh, the Casas Grandes culture um, in northern Chihuahua, Mexico, and I'll show you a map. This is a, if you want to look at uh, map number one, or the, sorry, the picture number one, you can see Chaco Canyon up in the northern New Mexico region, Pacime in northern Chihuahua, uh, Mimbres culture and Hohokam culture in southern New Mexico and southern Arizona respectively. And I'm broadening the picture in, in my talk today to look at further south and what's happening along the west coast of Mexico at the same time and seeing if we can correlate what's happening in the south with what's happening in the north. Okay, so but the, the two main areas that I'm going to talk about briefly is Chaco Canyon and, and then I'll focus a little bit more on Casas Grandes because it's a very important site that's, that's a hybrid culture basically that combines elements of the southwest and Mesoamerican elements as well. Has anybody ever visited Casas Grandes or the site of Pacime? All right, so what's there? <laughs> what, what, what is there that is Mesoamerican? Can anybody? Ball All right, so I-shaped ball courts is a very common Mesoamerican architectural feature and, and, and game. What else? Okay, Scarlet Macaws, Pacime was a preeminent breeder of tropical birds from, from uh, Mesoamerica, scarlet macaws, for their brilliant red plumage, which is associated, as we know from the ethnography of Pueblo peoples, with the sun, particularly the dawning sun. Okay, so, so what, anything else? Platforms. All right, so platform mound architecture. Uh, some of them are cross-shaped. Some of them are in the shape of feather, 
horned serpents. Um, but the architecture itself is very Puebloan, the multi-story adobe room blocks and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Chaco Canyon a little bit initially and then Casas Grandes. And segue into, if we're thinking about what's happening in this area in the broader picture at the same time as Pakime, we also want to think about social change during the Pueblo IV period. All right, so across Arizona and New Mexico, beginning at around 1300 AD, we see these ma this massive transformation in society. So social organization, political organization, religious organization, art, architecture, and, and many other things. So I'm going to talk about Pakime and the, the site itself and, and relate it to very specific aspects of social change in the Southwest. All right, so if we look at, uh, again, the map, a broader map, and this is a very crude drawing. <laughs> All right, so, okay, so what, it, so what I'm talking about initially, again, Chaco Canyon, this is supposed to be far northern New Mexico. All right, so at around, if we think about the broader Four Corners region at around 1200 to 1300, what is happening in this area? Does anybody know? All right, so ancestral Pueblo people, 1200 to 1300, what is, what is happening? Everybody's leaving, all right? So archaeologists have correlated this long-term period of drought with people leaving the Four Corners region, so Colorado and Utah are up here, okay, so Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde is up here, and people are moving south to Arizona. If you think about the modern Pueblos today in Arizona, New Mexico, this broad arc of Pueblos across the southwest. Pakime is part of that social change. And now, when, when we think about these social changes, we need to think about what is happening down here. Okay, so on your map, I have a, a, a list of sites all up and down the Pacific coast. This is, a, this, this is a cultural region known as the Aztatlan culture. All right, and so uh, an archaeologist named J. Charles Kelly was the first in the 1960s and 1970s to talk about Aztatlan. And it basically encompasses uh, Sinaloa, the, the Mexican states of Sinaloa, Nayarit, Jalisco is right here. Zacatecas is right here, so southern Zacatecas, southern Durango is here. But the core area of this Aztatlan culture is in southern Sinaloa and Nayarit. And for me in particular, because I've worked in this region, I transitioned from this area down to here, um, it's, it's, cr it's crucial to understand this area. As southwestern archaeologists, if we don't know what is happening down here, it's, we're only seeing part of the picture. Okay, so a lot of what we're seeing at Pakime is happening in, in, in West Mexico as well, but earlier in time, all right? So what are some, without looking at your cheat sheet, what are some of the things, again, aside from scarlet macaws, ball courts, what, is hap what are you seeing from Mesoamerica that shows up in the Southwest? Chocolate, that's the, big, that's the hot topic uh, with uh, Patricia Crown's recent research on chocolate. Where is that coming from? Anybody know? Central Mexico? Okay, Central Southern Mesoamerica and tropical areas. So that is the common uh, con conception, the common argument, is that it's coming from far to the south. So I'm working on that subject as well. And my argument, as we'll see, is that it's coming from West Mexico, from this Aztatlan area. All right, so if you look at your, your pictures, we get very distinctive, at Chaco Canyon, very, very distinctive tall cylinder vessels. In Mesoamerica, as Patty Crown pointed out, these are almost exclusively used for cacao. Does anybody know how these are used? Is it directly consumed from them? Or? Yes, so the foam, the froth, is one of the more important parts of cacao consumption. So you would use these tall cylinder vessels to pour it, sometimes at great heights, to get that very delicious, delicate foam. All right, so, all right, so let me flip now to, to this. All right, so we have copper, cop, copper ornaments, we have the ball game, 
We have scarlet macaws and sol solar ideology, uh, cacao, and so forth. A lot of these are ritual objects. So Ben Nelson has characterized this as a ritual economy. So very high status, elite uh, objects with very uh, um, profound ritual significance are moving up to the south. So these are elite commodities. All right, so. Now, if you turn to page two, all right, the Astatlan area, if you look at the top of your, your paper, is pretty far, all right? Pretty far from Chaco Canyon. It's about 1,000 miles away. If we were thinking about Chaco Canyon in relation to the heartland, the Astatlan heartland, where ev you know, everything is happening, there are these massive civic ceremonial centers, there's the ball game, uh, there's incredible iconography, which I have some images later in your, in your handout that you can see. All right, so for Chaco Canyon, for Chaco and people, this is about 1,000 miles away. For Pakime, this is about 650 miles. Okay, so how, how is, is there, inter, is there evidence of interaction? Um, if so, how is, how is this material moving over great distances? Are there people from the Southwest going down to get the material? Are there people from West Mexico coming up? Um, does it show up all up and down the coast? into the Southwest? These are questions that we need to, to answer. All right, so when we think about social change, okay, so let's, let's start talking about Pakime in more, more specifics. When we think about social change in the Pueblo IV period, which, which is about 1300 AD to 1600 or 1540 or 1600, um, there, are ma there are many significant changes that are occurring in the Southwest. And so on your, on your page two, I have a list and some of the imagery of, of murals and artifacts, ceramic artifacts, that show that we're getting very significant changes. So prior to 1300, or so, 1250, we get very geometric art, just simple, just lines and so forth, no real naturalistic imagery. But at around 1300, everything changes. So these, these images that I have, does anybody know where this, these beautiful mural scenes come from? Anybody tell me what those are? A little small, but... All right, Kiva murals. So these are Kiva murals from New Mexico, an important site called Pottery Mound. So very well-preserved um, murals of, of um, high ritual significance. What does the imagery indicate? Can anybody see what the images are? All right, so scarlet macaws. There's a, these are two women. You can tell by their, their uh, hair and their hair whirls on the left, uh, their, their clothing. They're holding scarlet macaws. They're surrounded by lightning, dragonflies. It's a very little picture. The woman on the left is standing on a rainbow, rainbow bass band. All right, so this is a, a very uh, highly charged solar scene. So there seems to be a solar theme associated with scarlet macaws that we're seeing in some of the imagery and, and art. Okay, so I have a list here of all of the dramatic changes that we see in the Pueblo IV period. All right, so everybody's leaving the northern southwest. It's a time of reorganization. New social organization, new religious organization like clown societies. We see the development of the Katsina ceremonial complex, uh, medicine societies, um, the shift to plaza-oriented pueblos. So Chuck Adams, Charles Adams has talked about uh, plazas a great deal. Um, and so dramatic changes. So this is at around 1300 or so. And if you'll look at uh, this ceramic vessel on the, on the lower right hand side, this is a, a, an image that caught my attention. All right, so this is, this is from a Rio Grande glazeware. So in the Eastern Pueblo region, anybody ever been to any of the Rio Grande Pueblos along uh, the Eastern part of New Mexico? All right, so these glazewares, these, uh, uh, glazewares show very beautiful uh, complex imagery. So this one in particular caught my attention. So I have an article that's going to be coming out uh, in the coming year in the Journal of the Southwest that talks about this particular icon. 
And I relate it to a particular solar deity in the Southwest. Okay, so we're going to continually come back to this solar theme. Okay, so this is known as the Capitan icon. This is a, a term that was derived from uh, the, uh, the, the Spanish word for captain. Alfred Kidder labeled it that because some of these Capitan images show it with a human face. So it's, a, it's like an anthropomorphic figure. And my argument is that this figure represents a solar deity. All right, so has anybody been to the corn dance, the Pueblo corn dance in, in the Rio Grande area? All right, so, the, so what we know from the ethnography is that many Pueblos up and down the Rio Grande area share a solar deity, and he is known as the Sun Youth. Okay, and so he's a, he's a young solar deity. He's a beautiful young man. He is the god of flowers. He's the god of feasting, art, sensuality, sex, reproduction, the growth of corn. And I have a list on the other side, on page three, that describes all of his characteristics. So this is, very, this is a very important. God of games. He's closely related to the corn maidens. He brings them back to the Pueblo each, each, uh, each year in the agricultural cycle. Okay, so everything that we know about this deity basically ties into all of those social changes that I outlined in, 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 on the second page. All right, so Katsina ceremonialism, medicine societies, plaza-oriented dances, um, Kiva murals, the solar-oriented Kiva murals. This is a very important deity. Okay, so in the Southwest, again, this deity only appears in the corn dance. Now, the reason I bring this up is because he is described as wearing a scarlet macaw headdress. So his headdress is, is comprised of scarlet macaw feathers that originate in Mesoamerica, originally. Okay? And, and, and so the reason I bring this up is because we see this deity in the archaeology. If you look on page three, this ceramic vessel with a, a human male wearing a scarlet macaw headdress is that young sun god of, of modern, modern pueblos. Okay, so this deity, this very important widely worshipped deity, is most earliest at Pakime. Everybody see that picture? I have another picture of, of him on the next page as well. So this is the young sun god. This is the sun youth at Pakime. So Pueblo, uh, modern Pueblo religion, is focused on a deity that originates at Pakime, is my argument. Okay, so we've, now let's transition to what's happening at Pakime, so we can get a better sense of why Pueblo people may have been interested in this deity, in this, in this area in northern Mexico. Um, can anybody tell me a little bit more about Pakime? Anybody that's been there, aside from the uh, platform mounds, the ball court, what else do we see there? All right, so we get uh, turkeys as well. So macaws and turkeys were uh, uh, macaw and turkey aviculture. Anybody? All right, so Steve Lexon has pointed out that there are some continuities of T-shaped doors from, from uh, sites in the southwest as well. Again, so this is a hybrid culture. Now I have a, I have a map, a picture that, that illustrates, again, some of these macaw raising pens, we get elite burials at the site, so it's very, uh, uh, seems to be pretty clear social hierarchies, so it's not really necessarily an egalitarian society. So elite burials, platform mound architecture, ball courts, water systems, reservoirs, feasting ovens as well. Okay, so, I, so my argument is that this solar deity that we see is very much integral to the organization of this society, social organization, political organization, and relig religious organization. And the, th the thing about this is, though, is that this deity did not originate at Pakime, originally. He comes from Mesoamerica. This originally is a Mesoamerican solar deity known as Xochipilli. All right, so if we look at uh, page three, I have a comparison between all of the attributes of, of the sun youth of the Southwest. The god of dawn wears the scarlet macaw headdress. He's the god of games and dancing and feasting and painting. Uh, he's associated with clowning and medicine societies. Every single attribute about this 
southwestern solar deity is identical to this solar deity in Mesoamerica. All right, so the name Xochipilli means flower prince. He's the prince of flowers. Everywhere he goes, you know, agricultural fertility abounds. Flowers uh, rise up. Flowers are associated with, with sex and sensuality and reproduction. Does anybody have any questions on any of this so far? Is this all pretty clear? Yes. Right, correct. No, not. Okay, so, so we are seeing, yes, so mem. Oh, okay, so we're seeing naturalistic imagery in the Southwest in the Pueblo IV period after 1300. We do see naturalistic imagery in Membres art at around, in classic members, black and white ceramics, and Patricia Gilman has talked about that, um, by 10, uh, 1030 AD. So we do see it earlier. Um, and so the relationship between that imagery and iconography to later time periods in the Pueblo IV period is a very important uh, theme that we, as archeologists, need to look into. What are the connections between this? All right. <laughs> Um, but, but, yes, so we see it in the south earlier than we see it in the north. All right, so, all right, so my idea about this solar deity is that when we think about Pakime, if you want to turn to the, to the next page, page four, is that we need to, as, as southwestern archaeologists, not solely focus on, and I've noticed this in the literature, when we talk about southwestern social change, everything seems to stop at the border. All right? So it's, it's rare territory for southwestern archaeologists, partly because you know, it's, a lot of the literature is in Spanish. Um, but we talk about social change without ever really including Pakime into the equation. All right? So that's what I meant by the southwest without Pakime. We've developed this history and story of social change without really understanding what's happening here. And likewise, in this area, we've developed histories and stories about what's happening without understanding what's happening in Mesoamerica. All right? So we need to look at the big picture and find the correlations between these social changes. All right? So it's, 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 it's a topic for southwestern archaeologists to look southward and Mesoamerican archaeologists to look northward and familiarize themselves with the literature. Okay, so, so what, I'm, what, what I'm suggesting for the Casas Grandes world is that Pakime was a very important political religious center. If you look at page four, that was a sort of a proponent or from this area in the south, a disseminator of this new religious complex of the sun youth. So if you look at this area in the far north, in this green hatched uh, kind of uh, dotted line area, this is where modern Pueblo people worship the sun god across Arizona, New Mexico. So this new religion is coming up from the south with the sun god. People from the Four Corners region are attracted to this new religion. This is associated with the depopulation of the Four Corners. All right, so a new religion coming up. Chaco, uh, uh, ancestral Pueblo people coming down. The society is becoming reorganized. All right, so at the same time, people in the Southwest most probably were really attracted to what's going, what's happening at Pakime. I would imagine because we get many different ceramic types from across the Southwest showing up at Pakime, that this, and again, this is tied into feasting. People are probably coming down to Pakime to learn the rituals of this new sun god, to bring it back up to the north, you know, having obtained scarlet macaw feathers, having obtained maybe copper bells. You know, this could have been the mechanism by which we see the dissemination of some you know, ritual commodities like that. Um, people maybe got married, you know, met potential mates and secured alliances for getting some of this, uh, these commodities. All right, so Pakime is a very important part of the equation for understanding what's happening in the Southwest. All right, so does anybody have any questions on, on any of this? Ask me anything. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that the Pueblo IV period, 
Okay. Do you see the Xochipilli as an avatar or a... Oh, sorry. Hello, hello. <laughs> Do you see Xochipilli as an avatar or a guise or a, um, 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 an outlet of Quetzalcoatl? Because so much of what he represents is what Quetzalcoatl represented. Well, okay, so Quetzalcoatl is a, a feathered serpent deity that has the, his most prominent roots at classic period Teotihuacan in central Mexico. That's where we first, we, we see it all the way back to the Olmec, um, but, he see, but he has his greatest fluorescence, at least artistically and politically, at Teotihuacan. And Quetzalcoatl is uh, preeminently a, associated with wind and rain. He oftentimes has conch, cut conch shells lining his body, sim symbolizing the spiral nature of wind. So he is a, he is a rain bringer. Um, he's not necessarily uh, like a young sun god like Xochipilli is, but so there's a very clear distinction. Some of his representations are as Venus, the rising star, the morning star, as well as a setting star, but the rising star turning into the sun. And one of the legends was his traverse over the sky um, as a sun god. Okay, so it's, it's com very complex, all right? Yep. So uh, one of the ways in which Venus, or sorry, one of the ways in which the feathered serpent ties into this complex is that we oftentimes see the feathered serpent as sort of a vehicle by which the sun traverses the sky. He's basically the pathway by which the sun uh, travels across the sky. So, the, so, there, so there is a Venus component to this, as you mentioned. Um, I have an article, a co-authored article in Journal of the Southwest last year where I talk about this feathered serpent Venus complex in central Mexico, west Mexico, northern Mexico, and the southwest. So yeah, there seems to be uh, an overlapping between these three deities. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you have a question as well, or? If you expand the area you're thinking about and go further south, uh -huh. and think about the interchanges between different groups there, what I'm hearing you talk about interchanges north from the US and south, it seems like a very different world in terms of People are going to find out about this, to learn a little bit about that, to bring some, some products, new ideas, and things like that. Whereas further south, there's huge conflicts between different groups. And I'm wondering if there's some explanation for the, the militarization, let's say, of of interactions between groups further south, if it has to do with the degree of social organization in those different areas, or is my concept or my question not even uh, pertinent in terms of, it seems you know, that there was a lot of conquest going on in central and southern Mexico, one group over another. And um, I'm not hearing that from what your discussion is. And I'm wondering what's the basis for that difference, if that difference is true. Okay, so do I think that there is a, okay, do I think that there is a conquest element to what I am discussing here? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I know that uh, people in the past have talked about Toltec conquest, you know, coming up to the, to the Southwest, which I disagree with. But when we think about West Mexico, which was what I'm going to transition into, in the same way as, as us needing to know what's happening down here to understand this area, in order for us to understand this area, we need to know what's happening in Central and Southern Mesoamerica. Um, it, particularly, J. Charles Kelly has talked about the Toltec and the Mixtec area, all right? And so this is early post-classic, 900 to uh, 11, 1100 or so, and then, uh, it, 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 uh, sorry, 900 to 1100 Toltec, and then Mixtec is uh, up to um, uh, beyond that. Um, what we see is, uh, transformation of central Mexican society. When we think about the collapse of Teotihuacan, the collapse of Monte Alban, what's happening is we're seeing a decentralization. So all of the big societies like Teotihuacan and, and Monte Alban in this area uh, are fragmenting. So that's known as the epiclassic period. And then the postclassic in southern Mexico is it's basically the formation of many independent uh, 
city-states, I guess you would call it, where there's this competitive feasting component to it. So there's a shift to the Pacific coast, all right? So there's competitive feasting. It's not necessarily like so much war and conflict, but, it, but forms of alliance building, all right? So there's marriage alliances that are formed along the coast and the expansion of trade networks. People are really interested in getting rare commodities. Uh, and so this is probably why this transformation, why we're seeing such broader, extensive um, interaction in the post-classic world. So uh, did you have anything in particular in mind in terms of examples of conquest? You know, if we think about maybe the Maya area, yeah, of course there's conflicts between uh, city-states, but we don't, we don't necessarily know. It's, so, it's such a poorly known area. There are very few people working in this area. For us to draw broad pictures about conflicts between uh, societies in this area at this point. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes? The theme is what would be different without Pack of May? And I'm wondering what would be different had Pack of May not existed? What would be different if Pocky May did not exist? Everything, <laughs> basically. Everything, basically. Um, I, I could talk about many subjects in relation to uh, the Pueblo world in the, in the Pueblo IV period and how it relates to Pocky May, but essentially what we're looking at in that time period is all of these changes are directly related to what is happening at Pocky May. All of the social, religious, and political organizations that, that I've outlined elsewhere I can tie back to what is happening at Pocky May. So, so these individual communities would have evolved on their own? It's uh, speculative. I mean, it's hard to say what, what everything would look like if Pocky May did not come about. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not, my perspective on this is that there is a base population that exists in the, in the Casas Grandes region. Paul Menes has, has talked about that and Michael Whalen. But that's the, there are some very key components that are, are non-local. And if we think about, again, a lot of not just the architectural stuff and not just the ritual commodities, but social organization as well is, is as I mentioned, is very sim the things that are happening here are very similar to what's happening here. So, so again, it's, it's difficult to know what the region would have looked like without it. I mean, it's... It, it's, it's speculation. What do you think? <laughs> All right, so let's, let's look at what's happening in the South. So we, we kind of know maybe about what's happening at Pakime in terms of this new solar religion, new things coming up from the South. What are the connections between Pakime and the Aztatlan area? So this is a really broad area in the South. We might think about it in terms of the coastal Aztatlan sites and the highland Aztatlan sites. They're very different. Aztatlan sites on the coast have huge earthen mound architecture. There's no, there's no masonry, well, very little masonry architecture. But up in the highlands, it's, it's very prominent, uh, elaborate masonry um, uh, uh, structures. Uh, this, constant, this area right here is where we see many large sites clustered around an estuary system, the Marismas Nacionales in Sinaloa, southern Sinaloa and Nayarit. We see ball courts and so forth. We see very elaborate, uh, very fine and elaborate uh, art and iconography. So I have some imagery of very beautiful feasting vessels. These are elite vet serving vessels, probably for community-wide feasting. We have many examples, uh, good examples of sil tall cylinder vessels. All right, so we're seeing transform very similar transformations in the Aztatlan world beginning at 900 as we see happening in the Southwest that happens at around 12 to 1300. And what I think, what I argue is happening is that many of these transformations in West Mexico, in Northern Mexico, and in the Southwest is correlated with the arrival of this young sun god, Xochipilli, and his complex. So this is Xochipilli in Central Mexico in the lower right with his scarlet macaw headdress. That's the sun youth in Mesoamerica, this, one, this guy down here. It's the same deity that we're seeing up at Pakime, it's the same deity that we're seeing up in the Southwest. 
And so everywhere we see him on this map that I have here, everywhere we see him showing up later in time as we move north, we see complete social transformation. So it's his political, religious, uh, economic complex that we're seeing. And this ties into what uh, Kelly Hayes Gilpin is, and Jane Hill have called the flower world. This is his complex. He's the flower prince. Does anybody, anybody see Kelly Hayes Gilpin's talk on the flower world? Anybody heard of the flower world? All right, it's this very, very beautiful, spiritual, solar domain where everything is in balance, everything is, is perfect. All right, so it's, it has to do with fertility and life and creation and so forth. Okay, so where we see this solar complex in West Mexico, again, is all across this region of, of Nayarit and Jalisco and southern Zacatecas and Durango, basically where we see the Aztatlan complex. And as it happens, where we see this Xochipilli complex is also where we see pronounced evidence of cacao cultivation. So all the way back to, I've traced cacao all the way back to 900 AD. This is where Chacoan people are getting their cacao. Anybody been to Puerto Vallarta? All right, so that's where the cacao is coming from. I traveled up and down that area two years and documented current areas of cacao cultivation. So even today, it's a very rich area, very rich microclimate for cacao. So this is a thousand miles away that Ch Chacoan people are, uh, are getting their cacao. Later in time, Casas Grandes people are interacting with these same people. Later, all right, so a few hundred years later. So at this area in particular, this very condensed area, is the area that Southwest archeologists need to pay attention to. Does that make sense? All right. Any other questions so far before we sort of wrap up? Yeah? All right. All right, let's get the one in the front first. Mexican um, archaeologists are not looking into this area at all, or are they not sharing the information that they have? It's a combination of both. All right, so each state has an ENA office, uh, National Institute of Anthropology and History, and some of them are less funded, well funded than others. So the ones that get the most attention are the, you know, the Aztec, you know, Central Mexico and Southern Mexico, in Central, uh, so Southern Mexico. In the West and the North, it's very little money, very little funding, very little, a uh, few scholars. Primarily, my opinion is because they don't know what's there. The coolest stuff, the biggest sites, the most uh, complex societies in West Mexico, um, in the post-classic, there's nobody getting trained, you know, students are not being trained to work in this area. There's two archaeologists for the entire state of Nayarit, Nayarit, Ina archaeologists. And so it's like a handful of people scattered across this broad area. And it's, there's no American students, no Me hardly any Mexican students in, involved in this area. Are they willing to share? That's another issue. <laughs> it's hard to... Uh, it, uh, I'm not going to comment too much on that, but <laughs> nobody really shares information. Yeah, so which is too bad. Yeah, in a way. But the, my colleagues are all generous and very kind and very willing to talk and stuff. But um, the the public there's very sparse publications. This is changing in recent years, but um, we're, I'm currently co-editing a volume that we're organizing through a, a pre. A, University of Utah Press to do an Aztatlan volume that should come out hopefully in two years. That'll give us more information so that our colleagues in the north can see what we're doing down there. And so I, I'm hoping to, that this will start a conversation among everybody to kind of uh, tie everything together rather than be more a little regionally focused. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Is there any other part? Yeah, so we need more dialogue, we need more collaboration, um, we need not just among archaeologists, but native people as well, because we, we need to understand oral traditions and migration traditions, which hold very, very valuable information that's equally valid for archaeological evidence as well. Matthew? Michael. Yes. Oh, Michael, excuse me. Well, maybe Matthew wants to answer this one. I don't know. Um, if this is such a new area, or not new, but it, uh, new to archaeology, if you will, uh -huh. in the fact that we don't have as much information because it hasn't been reviewed as much. Are, uh, what are the threats that are going on, if any, there? And are you worried that there will be enough change on the ground and through modern activities that you will never get 
that kind of, or is it still pretty remote? Uh, what, what's the th biggest threat um, to getting it? Well, there are, okay, so mainly the, 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 primarily, the primary peak of archaeology in this area, in the Astatlan area, was in the 1930s, 1940s, into the 1950s. UCLA ran a big project, archaeology and ethnohistory project. Um, that continued into the, the 60s and 70s. And right now, within the last decade, we're, we're seeing a resurgence. So there's a good crop of archaeologists that are working in this area. But I've traveled uh, throughout this area. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot, there's, there are many threats. There are, it's, um, especially on the coastal plain, is, is very um, rich agricultural alluvial soil. So there's, there's continual... Uh, plowing of, of some of these sites, of one of the uh, more well-known sites, um, well-published sites of Amapa. A lot of the big mounds are, are bulldozed through. There was a site that I visited last summer where I had seen two years before that looked like a really interesting, great site as, for, as a potential project. And the landowner took a bulldozer and cleared it out. You know, so there is, uh, there's not always repercussions, you know, in, in terms of uh, the destruction of sites. So. It, it's, that's one of the key things is that we need to get people working in this area before a lot of these, these sites are destroyed. There are very few well-preserved, barely looted sites that exist, but um, yeah. I, I wanted to make a comment about our Mexican colleagues. Um, one thing that I think people need to understand is that the sociology is, and, and the history of archaeology in Mexico is profoundly different. We can't judge it by North American standards. As you mentioned, there are, what, two archaeologists in Nayarit? Right. When I first went down in Chihuahua in 1984, there was one archaeologist literally for the entire state of Chihuahua, which is about the size of Arizona. Right. And so they're facing tremendous problems. But the other thing is um, they don't have the publication outlets that we have. And in fact, traditionally, meetings play a much stronger and more important role in Mexico communicating among people than in publications in many ways. Also, up until recently, almost all archaeologists were trained in exactly the same place. As you know. So they, so they know each other. So the sociology is quite a bit of not only is there not much money, not many archaeologists, but they operate in a very different way often than in North America. Publications, there just aren't as many outlets. And meetings are exceptionally important. And they know how to put on good meetings, let me tell you, unlike North Americans. Right. You should go to banquets at uh, Mexican uh, meetings. And so it's profoundly different. And now it's, things are changing, for example, in various places are now archaeology schools outside of Mexico City, which is a, a new development. And it'll change the sociology. More archaeologists are moving into the north and the west. But it's a very, very different situation. And we got to be not think of it as sort of an, a depauperate uh, North America, because it's also very different. I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with anything you said. I agree. Thanks to um, Sharon Urban. I'm a chocoholic. So I have a question about your chocolate study. Did you do a DNA analysis on your chocolate sources? DNA analysis? No. So how do you know your chocolate came from Nayarit? Okay, Other so than, you know, there's nice fields there of it are, down there. There are multiple lines of evidence that, that indicate it. So I, what I've done is I've looked at the archaeology, the ethnohistory, and the ethnography and the modern, how, how indigenous people in that area use cacao in which political and religious contexts <clears throat> and um, how that ties into this solar complex that I've identified in, in, in the archaeology. So archaeologically, uh, we have particular vessel forms showing up in the post-classic. So the tall cylinder vessels, we do not see before 900 AD. They just show up. There's also another vessel form that's uh, it's called, it's like pear-shaped, so kind of uh, globular. It's got a neck, bulbous body, and tripod feet. We know from southern Mesoamerica that this particular vessel form, especially in, in the, uh, the Mishtec area from the Codices, is used for cacao consumption. That does not appear prior to 900. So we see new ceramic vessel forms that indicate that cacao consumption, that these were likely used for cacao consumption. As part of my cacao study, I took samples uh, of the paste of the interior of ceramic vessels from the site of Amapa. The collections are at UCLA. Took 17 samples. Four of those uh, were tested by uh, Hurst, Jeffrey Hurst, uh, the chemist, the head chemist at uh, Hershey's. 
and he concluded that, that four of those t uh, contained cacao. So the chemical residues were present in the interior of the vessels. So that's archaeological evidence. Uh, Ethnohistoric evidence, we have a, a number of indications that uh, cacao was observed by Spaniards when they came into the region as early as the 1530s and 1540s where it was being cultivated basically around the Puerto Vallarta region and north, um, it, precisely where it is being grown today by, by modern populations. Uh, the indigenous people that are descendants of Aztatlan people, we Chol and Cora, use cacao even today, or modern chocolate, in their ceremonies um, as food for the gods, basically in the same way that cultures in Mesoamerica do. And the very first drink uh, is offered to the sun. So it's, it ties into the solar complex. The deity Xochipilli that I talk about is the patron of cacao in Mesoamerica as well. He's portrayed carrying seed cacao beans in a little knapsack in some of the codices as well. So there's many overlapping multiple lines of evidence that, that, con that, drew, that uh, led me to that conclusion. by saying, you just triggered this by saying the beans on his back in the Chochopili uh -huh. complex. Right. Um, relating that at all to the Cocopelli or what, well, all the, it's the, it's the feathers and the pack, backpack and the dispersion of that particular element all the way up from the area you're talking about um, into the northern areas. Just right. curious. I understand. Now, uh, so we have the hunch, the Coco Pelli, the hunchback uh, flute player. I, there are some studies that uh, I've seen where people have tried to correlate the, co the Coco Pelli imagery with some rock art in, I think it was Durango as well. Uh, my personal thoughts on this, and I haven't really like delved into the evidence for when the Cocopelli imagery begins to appear. I think it's a lot earlier in time, prior to when we see this, this, this Sun Youth complex, um, is that he's a, like he's a, he's a cicada. He's a, he's a flute player. Dude, there's no, to my knowledge, in the Aztatlan area, particularly on the coast where his complex is centered, there, I, I've never seen uh, imagery that we can correlate with a Cocopelli complex. Uh, but he is a very sexual being, for sure, that we can maybe relate that to him. But, uh, mm, but, but Xochipilli himself, he's portrayed as well. He's not always portrayed with a scarlet macaw headdress. This is a very rare example, but he's also portrayed in many different ways. He can be, well, we know for, for, for the Southwest, the Sun Youth, he can, he can transform into to basically anything. He can be an old man. That he can be a butterfly that comes out, you know, that he plays a flute where butterflies come out. He can be many different things. Is the uh, Pacame site uh, protected in any way by the state? It's a world. Her it's a world heritage site. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it's, it's, but I mean, is it? Uh, it's a world heritage site, but is it also protected by the state? I mean, does it have some kind of a special designation within the country, or is it just a World Heritage Site? Paul Menace, Paul Menace would be a good, a good person to ask about that. I don't know the details of, around the situation of the protection of the site, but... Sorry, I didn't mean just a World Heritage Site. We're a very <laughs> special site if it's a World Heritage Site. It's a Zona Arqueológica, which is like a national monument or a national park. It has very strong legal protections. In fact, all archaeological sites in Mexico are owned by the federal government, whether it's on your, on your own land or not. Uh, that doesn't always work out in reality very well. But Pakime, there's uh, guards, there is a museum, there's an archaeologist, there is a spectacular museum there. And there are other sites as well that are Zona Arqueológicos. For example, uh, not too far away to, to the west in the Sierra Madres, there's Cave Valley. There's also Cuarenta Casas and some others. And they're all over there, Zona Arqueológica. And they're basically the equivalent of a national monument or a, a national um, a park. And so they're, they're relatively well protected. And in Pakime's case, the people of Chihuahua in that area love Pakime and, um, and are very protective of the site itself. Not always of the other sites around it, but the site of that, self, uh, of that site. And relating that to what's happening in West Mexico, the only, only archaeolo Ostatlan archaeolo archaeological site that's op pr you know, protected in that manner and open to the public is, is the site of Ixlan del Rio, or Los Toriles, which is in the southern part of Nayarit, in the highlands. There, are on, there is ongoing work at other Aztatlan sites uh, in, in Zacatecas. There's a site called El Teul, 
which uh, archaeologists are currently in the process of uh, um, trying to open to the public as well. And I know some of my colleagues are working in sites in Jalisco around Puerto Vallarta to try to develop some of these sites and protect them as well in, in that same manner. Go ahead first. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just wanted to point out that a good deal of the endless shell from Pakime comes from Banderas Bay. A good deal. Not there is some. Melon, there's a particular uh, shell well, called. Still, Melon. it's another connection. Right, right, right. So the furthest economic network in terms of shell is a particular form of shell pendant uh, of Melangina petula, which comes. Uh, uh, from this area, but there's also Periscula bandera, which comes from Banderas Bay. So there are some pendants that are identical in the Astatlan area that, that are at, at Pakime as well. All right? So they have very extensive ec economic networks that go right into the heart of the Astatlan area, for sure. All right. Okay, there's a style of pottery that sounds very much like what you're describing as uh, one of the cacao, the pear-shaped cacao mm -hmm. that originates in Costa Rica in what I think may be an earlier period. Is there any relevance to that? Like Nicoya, are you talking about yes. Nicoya polychrome? All right, so the particular form of uh, pariform or pear-shaped globular oyas with tripod. Yeah, we see this, uh, my, my uh, other colleagues have, have pointed out that these are, you typically see these things uh, showing up in the post-classic along the coast. So they're very coastal oriented. So you see them in Nicoya. You do see some of those in, in Toltec art though, in, in, in Tohoe Um uh, You see them along the Gulf Coast of, of Veracruz as well. And so as far, as, as far north as I've tracked them is up to Northern Sinaloa, Guasa the site of Guasave. So whether those are uh, cacao vessels will need to do a little more investigation in terms of the, doing the residue analysis. Thank you. Uh -huh. But most, yeah, so most probably that vessel form is influenced from the south, for sure. Mm -hmm. One more. So your talk tonight is really reminiscent of the world systems model, and it's I'm curious, we see you pointed out a lot of movement of items and ideas and perhaps a religious complex from the south to the north. Is there any reverberation of things in the north moving south, not just in trinkets like turquoise beads, but anything more substantial in terms of perhaps social organization or ideology? Yeah, so that, the, the paper that I'm preparing for uh, for uh, submission for, for, for cacao is, yeah, basically I'm, the, the subtitle of that is a world systems analysis. So um, with regard, so yeah, much of my work, again, focuses upon identifying what is, what is happening in the South and in, in Mesoamerica and West Mexico and the implications for what is happening there on Southwestern social change. So that's basically sort of a first step is, as a framework uh, of looking at the broader picture. So uh, uh, the next step, and I've, I've thought about this along the way in terms of what could be happening in the North that could impact uh, things, social change and reorganiz reorganization in the South. And it's a very valid uh, uh, question. And so that's where, uh, uh, in, in terms of objects, if we're thinking about uh, ritual objects, I don't, I don't necessarily see much moving to the south in terms of influence that might impact uh, social reorganization in West Mexico. I've not really identified anything. I mean, to me, most of, the, most of the influence is, is a, north, a south to north trajectory. But it's, of course, we have to think about what, it, what is going, what is happening in the north that influences the south. And so that's, that's sort of... Uh, uh, a uh, future trajectory that we collectively need to address, for sure. Michael, thank you very much.